Immediately following the talk, there will be a book sale and a reception, and Ken will sign books. The director of the literary arts is Sharon Babcock, and I'll now introduce her to introduce Ken Gorman. Sharon Babcock. and it's wonderful to see you all. We welcome Ken Gormley back to Chautauqua today as we honor his book, The Death of American Virtue, Clinton vs. Starr. Released in 2010, in February this year, the book uh, features exclusive and multiple interviews with President Bill Clinton, Special Prosecutor Kenneth Starr, Monica Lewinsky, Susan McDougall, and Paula Jones among approximately 165 other persons involved in the investigation and legal proceedings. Mr. Gormley is Dean of the Duquesne Law School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's here today with his wife, Laura, who I saw earlier and lost her. So, Laura, you're out there somewhere. We're glad you're with Ken. Uh, Mr. Gormley specializes in constitutional law and is a renowned expert on the Watergate scandal. His Archibald Cox, Conscious of a Nation was published in 1997, was also a CLSC selection, and won the 1999 Bruce K. Gould Book Award for Outstanding Publication Related to the Law. I just learned today that this book, The Death of American Virtue, has also been so honored, and Ken is the first author to receive this award twice. writing has appeared in the Stanford Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, and newspapers around the nation. He's also testified twice before the United States Senate and appeared as a legal commentator on national radio and television broadcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, readers and writers, the curious, and those of you who have already made up your mind, please welcome <laughs> Jeff Miller, Shira Babcock, Tom Becker, uh, for inviting me to speak today, and everyone on the CLSC uh, board for selecting my book for the honor, and especially Julie Follinsby and the Barton Fund, whose, whose endowment funded this lecture. Of all the events I've done since the book's release in February across the United States and in Europe, this is the most special for me. It took nine years to write this book, uh, and I literally began and ended it in Chautauqua. As Shira mentioned, I uh, wrote the biography of Archibald Cox, the principal Watergate special prosecutor, most of you remember, who stood up to President Nixon and was fired during the infamous Saturday Night Massacre. That came out in 1998, and my very first major book talk was standing right here in the Hall of Philosophy to talk about that book with my wife, Laura, and our then little kids in tow for our very first trip to Chautauqua. And incidentally, I've spoken here a number of times since then and never had the chance to publicly thank Laura, who has been my partner, partner in all these projects. Any of you who write know that a, a book of this magnitude is really uh, requires a commitment by the whole family. And Laura has been my mainstay. So Laura, we lost you. Where are you? Could you stand up for a second? Ladies and gentlemen, Laura Gormley is here somewhere. Oh, she's hiding in the back right there. Um, I may not write another book for nine more years, so I figured I'd better thank her now. Um, so the year after the Cox book came out in 1999, as the Clinton Star battles erupted, leading into an impeachment trial, I became a talking head on television because there weren't many, quote, experts on special prosecutors. And so I was invited back to speak in the amphitheater in Chautauqua to reflect on this collision between Clinton and Starr that had really turned the country upside down by this point. And that speech in Chautauqua in 1999 literally turned into the blueprint for this book. It forced me to start sorting out the causes for this titanic struggle between Clinton and Starr. And it was also that kind of aha moment where you realized there was an incredible story here. So since we're among friends at this gathering, I thought I'd begin by sharing a piece of the narrative that I rarely share in public. And that is the true story of my first meeting with President Bill Clinton in 2004. This took place in downtown Pittsburgh. Any of you who know it, the, the Grand William Penn Hotel 
downtown. I had worked uh, five years to get President Clinton to give me a half hour to try to pitch him on this book. We were on the very top floor. He had just come in from signing books of his own. We were in this just beautiful place, just myself and President Clinton, with a spread of food bigger than this whole area up here. And uh, he was on some kind of Atkins diet at the time, and he was looking at it, and he said, I can't eat this expletive deleted. It has mayonnaise in it. And so he grabbed a, a big plate of french fries, and he said, come on, Ken, let's just eat some fries. <laughs> so we talked for nearly 45 minutes, and Bill Clinton agreed to cooperate. Uh, we were going to set up interviews in a couple of months. I was literally ecstatic. I had landed the President of the United States. I was running around my desk at Duquesne Law School celebrating this. And then two days later, my research came, assistant came in and said, did you hear the news about President Clinton? He said, he's having quadruple heart bypass surgery. I said, oh my god, the French fries, I've killed President Clinton. Uh, so it was nothing short of a miracle when his lawyer, David Kendall, called me a couple of months later as he was, the president was just recuperating, literally. So I met him in Philadelphia where his heart surgeon was uh, for the first interview session. It was a remarkable project, ladies and gentlemen, from beginning to end. And so like most things in life that turn out to be worthwhile, this happened through pure serendipity. The book on Archibald Cox, notice, came out just as the Monica Lewinsky story was exploding in the national media. And in fact, I was one of the first people to question whether Ken Starr even had jurisdiction to go into that investigation in a story written by Neil Rosen in the New York Times, because I knew from Waterbeek that Cox had a specific charter that said what he was allowed to investigate and that he and Attorney General Elliot Richardson agonized constantly about not going beyond that charter. So I wrote, wrote op-eds for the New York Times, the LA Times, all over the country, most of which would have been viewed as pro-Clinton, but I never criticized in all of my writings Ken Starr personally. I knew him from professional circles. He was a distinguished, as you know, this uh, week on the Supreme Court, former Solicitor General, uh, former U.S. Court of Appeals judge. He had achieved what any, the greatest honors any lawyer could achieve, so I did not view him as a rabid right-wing political zealot out to topple, topple the President of the United States, and I said that publicly. I attended the first day of the impeachment trial in the Senate, in January of 1999, it was a chilling and historic scene, and I kind of knew just standing there that I was destined to write something about this whole saga. Quite honestly, ladies and gentlemen, you could not have made this story up in your wildest imagination if you had tried to invent, invent the craziest piece of fiction. And what really intrigued me in, in doing my research was there were a hundred moments where changing even one minuscule fact, like the fact that the editor of the American Spectator magazine told me it was a mistake that they had included the name Paula in that story about the woman who President Clinton had called up to his hotel room. The magazine had a policy against that, but the name got in. If you had changed any one of these many, many facts, the tumblers of history would have fallen into a different configuration and this book would have ended at chapter two. So fate had a hand in writing this book. Uh, a number of the talk show hosts have, and uh, Jim this morning, the radio guy, was commenting on the fatness of it. And I always say, look, some of the Harry Potter books are longer than this, and this story is even more unbelievable. <laughs> so it covers the whole Clinton scandals, uh, broadly defined from beginning to end starting with the well-known Whitewater investment orchestrated by a man named Jim McDougal, who got then young Attorney General Bill Clinton and his wife Hillary to invest in it. Uh, and then McDougal's unorthodox business practices, leading him to be convicted of fraud and defrauding SNLs in a company named Madison Guarantee Savings and Loan, and caused him to become a convicted felon who turned on the Clintons when they got to the White House followed by the tragic suicide of Vince Foster the next year, and it was suicide. I spent a lot of time on this during Clinton's first year of office. 
immediately followed by the allegations by Paula Jones of sexual harassment, which caused people, as some of Clinton's aides told me, to start connecting dots that really didn't connect, all of which morphed into the Monica Lewinsky events and turned into the second impeachment trial of a president in American history. Early on when I told President Clinton's former aide, George Stephanopoulos, that I was embarking on this book project, he told me if anyone could talk to both sides and show how all of these pieces interconnect, because they do interconnect, they will have an incredible story. And that's what I set out to do. So the first person I approached was Ken Starr. I figured if he shut me down, I wasn't going to write this book. I wanted to be the person who wrote the definitive neutral historical account of these events. And that wasn't going to happen if one side shut me out completely. And because I had written these pro-Clinton articles, I wanted to go to Ken Starr first. To my surprise, he immediately agreed to cooperate. And this was just as he was leaving the Office of Independent Counsel and in, in late 1999. And with a little coaxing, I'm a former litigator, so I go after papers wherever I go. With a little coaxing, he turned over his own personal files from this period, which allowed me to read letters that he was writing to his children, and emails, and letters to his mom in Texas, because I wanted to show that this was a disturbing experience for Ken Starr and his family, too, which was often overlooked. I also spent a lot of time in Arkansas, hanging out with folks who had known Bill and Hillary Clinton since childhood, Bill, Joe Purvis, who took me fishing on the White River to see where white water was, uh, Marge Mitchell, Bill Clinton's mother's best friend who drove me around Hot Springs, uh, and I also spent a lot of time in Washington talking to folks who had been political associates of the Clintons from the start. But I also went to Texas and spent time with Ken Starr and his, uh, much of his family and people he had known growing up. Here was the part that was really surprising. I found it striking that Clinton and Starr had so much in common. They were literally born within a month of each other, the same year, within a month of each other, within a couple hundred miles of each other, almost the flip side of the same coin. And so I, I also saw that they were both people of very modest means growing up. Ken Starr, uh, his house was a little white house that had been an army barracks and was dragged up the road and planted in a cow pasture in San Antonio. And that's where his father made his living as a barber and as a preacher. So these were men totally self programmed <coughs> who rose to the pinnacle of their careers at very early ages, which is why it is so doubly tragic when they end up colliding in this massive train wreck as the story moves on. And incidentally, I give a lot of credit to both President Clinton and Ken Starr because in my first meetings with them, I made very clear that I was not going to attempt to vilify and demonize either side and paint them out as people with horns coming out of their heads. But both men agreed to cooperate, I think, because they knew someone had to write this account. Uh, and fortunately, they trusted me to do it and call it down the middle. I had three interviews with President Clinton, two of them at his home in Chappaqua, New York. Uh, this was clearly an unpleasant topic for him. Uh, but again, I think that both uh, men were prepared to let me try to do a fair job, and that's what I set out to do. I was fortunate to interview most of the key players in this drama. Uh, I interviewed most of Ken Starr's prosecutors. I interviewed Monica Lewinsky. Lewinsky extensively and her family, Linda Tripp, who wired, uh, who tape recorded all those conversations with Monica Lewinsky, Paula Jones, uh, Attorney General Janet Reno, Chairman Henry Hyde, senators and congressmen on both sides of the political aisle. I wanted to hear the story directly from them rather than relying on one dimensional caricatures that had been created in the media. So let me give you some broad impressions of some of the major players uh, based upon my interviews with them. First, Monica Lewinsky. Um, she was probably the toughest interview of all of the interviews that I did. 
And that surprised me. She's extremely smart. She knew what she was going to talk about and not talk about. And she had been burned by so many people that she was just extremely wary of any writer. Anyone who doesn't understand that this was the most devastating thing that ever happened to her and her family doesn't understand this story. Um, the only way that I can describe it, try to describe it, is like this. Certainly if you have, if you're a young woman and you have an affair with a married man who also happens to be President of the United States, you must suspect something good might not come of this if it's found out. And incidentally, she's not the first young woman in the world to make this kind of bad judgment. Um, but she might have imagined that her picture may have ended up on the cover of a tabloid magazine, but she would never have imagined that she'd be surrounded by five FBI agents and seven prosecutors and told she's going to jail and told that her mother might go to jail and that the president might be impeached because of her conduct. Which is why she told me, as Ken Starr's prosecutors were grilling her in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, she literally was thinking about jumping out a window. Um, so Monica was truly out there by herself. We don't really think about this. The White House wasn't coming to her rescue. Remember there were stories about her being a stalker and having sexual fantasies. And Ken Starr's office wasn't coming to her rescue either because they had this dirty little secret about their treatment of Monica in the Ritz-Carlton that had put them at odds with each other from the start. I spent a day with Monica in a storage facility in Greenwich Village, New York, going through documents. We were sitting on these folding chairs going through documents from this period. I can tell you it was extremely painful and discombobulating for her. She's one of the few people I can tell you who openly admitted to her mistakes and the pain that it caused her, that she caused pain for the country. Um, I think few people understood, however, what a horrible thing this was for everyone in her family, and still is. Linda Tripp, uh, you may not like this, but she's an extremely smart, likable lady. Um, I actually visited her farm in Virginia. Uh, she made homemade spaghetti and meatballs for me. They were actually very good. Um, and I can tell you, if you were to sit at the kitchen table with Linda Tripp, you would not say, boy, this is a person who is treacherous and manipulative. This was rather someone who was conflicted from beginning to end. She was distrustful. There's no question of the Clinton White House from the start. Uh, and that eventually developed into a sort of paranoia. And you probably don't know this part of the story unless you've read the book, but she actually was a holdover from the Bush administration and worked in the White House outside the Oval Office. And Linda Tripp told me, twice actually, that she believed Hillary intentionally moved her out of that post up to the West Wing with the White House Counsel Office because Hillary was afraid that Bill was going to hit on her. Um, so this is Linda Tripp. Strangely enough, she also becomes the last person ever to see Vince Foster alive. She was his secretary. And so she begins churning up these stories about uh, the mysterious circumstances surrounding Vince's death. Is, and this is, and, and is looking into writing a book with the literary agent Julia, uh, Lucy Ann Goldberg, this is long before she gets moved to the Pentagon and meets this young woman named uh, Monica Lewinsky. So I think on one hand, Linda Tripp genuinely believed that she needed to expose the fact that President Clinton had this affair with a young woman to the American public to expose this character flaw to the world. But in the process of doing that, she betrayed Monica Lewinsky, who was her friend, and helped to set into motion this train wreck. In fact, one of the real interesting things I discovered is even the star prosecutors came to distrust her because it turned out there were erasures on her tape, and she had denied that there were any erasures. So they had to go back at the last minute and scrub the entire star report of any reference to those trip tapes, and you won't find it in the star report, because they feared they were tainted. So ultimately, Linda Tripp becomes a victim of a scandal that she herself set into motion. Ken Starr, 
I know there's an impression shared by quite a few people that Ken Starr was on a witch hunt. I have to tell you that I didn't find that. He's a gentleman, a lawyer's lawyer. Uh, in fact, I helped to arrange to have Ken Starr come speak here in 2003. Some of you may have seen him in Chautauqua. Um, I found no evidence that he was a partisan zealot out to bring down Bill Clinton. In fact, to the contrary, my research showed that he was extremely deferential to the president, to the point that at times some of his staffers felt that he was being too deferential, too weak, and they were concerned about it. Here's the part that's unfair about pinning all of the blame on Ken Starr. Don't forget that most of what Ken Starr completed during his time there, until we get to Monica Lewinsky, had already been set in motion by his predecessor, Robert Fisk. The investigation of Jim McDougall, the investigation of Webster Hubble. So these were not new things, and no one accused Robert Fisk of being uh, on, a, uh, on a partisan witch hunt. Where I believe that Ken Starr went wrong, and I've told Ken this, was in expanding into the Monica Lewinsky investigation. In fact, I think he was the last person in the world who should have ever touched that investigation. His whitewater probe by this point was almost wrapped up. He was ready to move on to Pepperdine where he wanted to go. The, uh, he, he was ready to, to end this thing. And you have to remember that the independent counsel law was all about public perception. It was enacted after Watergate, whether you agree with it or not, to make sure that when there were investigations of officials at the highest level of the executive branch, the public had complete confidence that there was, this was a fair investigation and that the person picked had to be absolutely neutral. Now think about it. At this point, half of the country, rightly or wrongly, believed that Ken Starr had an ax to grind, that he was, he was out to get Clinton. Even if that was completely wrong, he never should have agreed to take this case. Now, to be sure, Attorney General Janet Reno has to share some of the blame because she did ask the three-judge panel to authorize him to expand into the Lewinsky investigation. But my research showed that Ken Starr's investigators pushed, his prosecutors pushed very hard to take over the Lewinsky case. And I think that Ken Starr deferred far too much to his prosecutors time after time allowing them to set an extraordinarily aggressive tone to this investigation. To his credit, Ken Starr told me, looking back on it, that if he had it to do over again, he would not have gone into the separate Lewinsky investigation, knowing how explosive it would be. But he did allow his prosecutors to take him down this path. And so the Lewinsky investigation unalterably changed his legacy. And I believe that history would have treated him quite different if he had simply wrapped up his Whitewater investigation and gone home. Bill Clinton. Um, some of you know that uh, Chautauqua played a special part in the Clinton presidency. Bill and Hillary came here in October of 1996, dra drawn here, as many of us are, by the solitude, by the beautiful, at that time, pastel color uh, fall leaves that were blowing across the lawn of the Athenaeum over there to prepare for the first debate, the first presidential debate against Senator Bob Dole. Some of you New Yorkers probably know the Clintons pretty well. My own invitation to Chelsea's wedding got lost in the mail. I can tell you. <laughs> um, but I did spend enough time with folks in Arkansas and with President Clinton himself to form some pretty firm opinions, impressions about the nature of his character. And some of these surprised me. One of the most surprising things to me that isn't necessarily part of his public persona, I think, was what a very thoughtful person he is in a very old-fashioned sense. Not in a sense that he's trying to show off so that people see this for the 10 o'clock news. I mean, that's his political persona. But the, the simple story I can tell you is I went with his mother's best friend, Marge Mitchell. We went to a nursing home in Hot Springs to see uh, Clinton's old um, teacher, one of his old teachers from high school. And also I met with his mother's best friend's mother, Mimi No, who was 90 years old. 
And she told me that every year on her birthday, Clinton, whether he was in Egypt, Pakistan, Africa, South America, would call her and, and say, Aunt Mimi, did you see me on television? Did you see I was wearing the coat you gave me uh, for Christmas? This, I can't even remember my own kids' birthdays, by the way, but this was something that was recurrent over and over from the time he was a child, an extremely thoughtful person. Don't forget he grew up in near poverty in Hope and Hot Springs, and so he rose from there to become the, the, the leader of the free world. He always favored the underdog, and that's why I think he sought, fought so ferociously against Ken Starr, because in this case, he was the underdog. But I have to say there was some extreme recklessness on his part, without which these scandals never could have gained traction and this book never could have been written. The most vivid example I can give you is this. At the time President Clinton was having this affair with Monica Lewinsky in the White House, the Supreme Court, you've been learning about the Supreme Court and certiorari and granting appeals, the Supreme Court was granting cert, taking the appeal of the Paula Jones case. And the Paula Jones lawyers in Virginia were on national television saying they were going to go into the issue of other women. Now that, folks, is reckless. And um, I, I do want to say that both sides have to share some of the blame for this train wreck. And I think that it's it's time that all Americans face this and look in the mirror and recognize that. And that, a number of people have asked where the title comes from. I can tell you that that's where I believe the title came from. Uh, and, and I know there has been some discussion of this in some of the book clubs, but when I talk about American virtue, I'm talking about a notion of public virtue. And let me lead to the part where this comes up in the book, and I'll read it in a second. We're getting to the section dealing with the bloody impeachment trial, the, well actually first the battle in the House of Representatives. And Ken Starr's team and Bill Clinton's team are literally fighting to the death. At this point, Time Magazine, in the midst of this bloodbath, it's December of 1998, decided to give both Clinton and Starr sort of faint praise by putting both of their pictures together side by side on the cover of Time Magazine. And in the swirl of this pandemonium, Ken Starr's 90-year-old mother, Vanny Mae Starr, dies in Texas, causing Ken terrible grief. He's, he's worrying that all of this has put a strain on his mother and been, caused her sorrow in her last years on Earth. He, in the midst of all this, he's late to get, he doesn't get there for visitation at the funeral home, but he does get to the cemetery in time for the burial where he stands by her grave and weeps aloud. And so that's where this little excerpt comes from. As he bid farewell to the woman who had reared him and taught him to lead a humble and honorable life, Ken Starr found a bitter irony in the fact that his face was appearing on the covers of millions of copies of Time magazine, covers that his mother would never see. The Time article, in fetting two men locked in a political fight to the death, as the country tumbled into a new year with a Senate impeachment trial pending, amounted to a backhanded compliment to both recipients. It was as if the magazine were presenting a dubious award to two combatants who had engaged in a prolonged, bloody, undignified struggle that had stripped away the mystique of public service, thus hastening the death of American virtue. The timepiece began. For rewriting the book on crime and punishment, for putting prices on values we didn't want to rank, for fighting past all reason a battle whose casualties will be counted for years to come. Bill Clinton and Kenneth Starr are Time's Men of the Year. There used to be a time, I believe, when people like Archibald Cox and Elliot Richardson and others populated government posts who understood that exercising restraint was an essential component of exercising power responsibly rather than trying to burn down the cost of the house at all costs in order to win. And here in this story, there are plenty of excess, uh, examples of excess on both sides. On the star side, 
pushing to expand into the Lewinsky case was obviously the most significant. But a second big mistake, real irony in this, was including so much sexual detail in the Starr report rather than sending Congress a cut and dry roadmap of evidence that, as had been done during Watergate. Ironically, a number of the Clinton advisors told me that Bill Clinton was in maximum peril in August of 1998. This is right after he's gone into the grand jury and said, uh, after months and months of saying he did not have an affair with that woman, Miss Lewinsky, he goes into the grand jury and said, you know what, I forgot, I did have a relationship with Monica Lewinsky, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, I should not have to leave office and I made a mistake. Well, quite a few Democrats in Congress, I learned, were ready to bolt on Clinton at that moment. And that could have been the beginning of the end of because don't forget that it wasn't the opposite party that drove Richard Nixon out of office. It wasn't the Democrats. It was when the Republicans came to him and told him he had to leave. That's what Clinton's advisors were fearing more than anything. And ironically, it was the Star Report, because it was so over the top, that saved Bill Clinton. Because Democrats in Congress rallied around him. Um, because this was so excessive, as did Hillary Clinton, remember? Because she was saying, wait a minute, this is my anger, this is my humiliation, and you're trying to use it as a political weapon to, to end my husband's presidency? So Hillary rallied behind her husband. Uh, in a word, the Star Report backfired terribly. But finally, the treatment of Monica Lewinsky at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel was the ultimate low point for the Office of the Independent Counsel. I interviewed Joanne Harris, and this has never been made public before. Joanne Harris, the former head of the criminal division of the Justice Department, was hired by Starr's replacement, Robert Ray, to in essence investigate the investigators, to look into the allegations that the Starr team had misbehaved in their handling of Monica Lewinsky especially. That report is still under seal. Uh, I was able to at least get an oral version of that report from Joanne Harris, who told me that she interviewed everyone. She would not have touched Monica Lewinsky with a 10-foot pole. Starr's office did not acquit itself well. She said she would not have touched Monica Lewinsky after she asked for her lawyer to talk to her lawyer, Frank Carter, not once but multiple times. The problem was that Ken Starr's prosecutors felt they had become so distrustful of Bill Clinton by this point, some of it perhaps for so brief, for good reason, that they finally felt that they had nailed him. They finally felt, as Jackie Bennett, one of Ken Starr's prosecutors, told me that they were ahead of the curve. But as a prosecutor, you're not supposed to get ahead of the curve. And so this whole sting of Monica Lewinsky was mishandled. If it had been handled differently, uh, the country may have been spared a year's worth of trauma. And incidentally, one thing we did learn from this whole sordid affair was that when asked about it, people will lie about having extramarital affairs. We did figure that part out. <laughs> um, but on the Clinton side of the, the equation, though, Clinton's being untruthful and evasive in the Jones deposition was not a good thing. Take a default judgment, for God's sake, but you have a federal judge in there telling you you have to answer these questions truthfully. You may believe that you're being set up and bludgeoned to death politically, but take a default judgment. This is the former attorney general of a state. He knows the meaning of taking an oath. Do not lie under oath. And, eat. and there was a real issue of whether there were any damages to speak up in the Paula Jones case anyway. So pay $100,000 and let it go. And also coaching Betty Curry, his secretary. Remember, he came back after the deposition and called her in and said, I was never alone with Monica Lewinsky, was I? Um, all of these questions clearly crossed over the line and solidified only more so in the minds of the star prosecutors that Bill Clinton would do anything possible to cover up the truth and his ongoing untruthfulness to, a, uh, to the point that he literally did not tell the truth to his own lawyers was certainly a major factor that nearly wrecked his presidency. 
Let me just think, let me just say that, that I think President Clinton does get this, and um, I, I want to just read one little passage today. It's still an extremely difficult topic for him to talk about any of this. Uh, I haven't read this little passage anywhere else, but I thought it was appropriate here. It was truly one of the most poignant moments in all of my hundreds of interviews for this book. Um, this was getting a glimpse of Bill Clinton during our final interview session. Even years later, having, having commenced a new life in New York with a wife who had become a national political figure in her own right, Bill Clinton refused to talk about his amorous relationship with Monica Lewinsky, despite his willingness to grant interviews to dis discuss almost every other aspect of the Starr investigation that had nearly toppled his presidency. Yet Clinton occasionally let down his guard and spoke frankly about the personal impact of this scandal upon him and his family. Dressed in a brown vest perfect for tramping around his backyard in Chappaqua and appearing rested and fit, Clinton lifted his eyes upward. There were really some positive aspects, he reflected. I mean, you know, if you live a busy life, you risk the fact that a lot of your life goes unexamined, both the good and the bad parts of it. And then all of us have secrets and we're entitled to them. But once you've been publicly humiliated like I was, you really don't think you have anything to hide anymore. It really doesn't much matter what people ever say about, the, about you again for the rest of your life and it's kind of liberating. Clinton took a moment to chew on an unlit cigar, his doctors advised him against smoking after his heart surgery, before adding that the nasty battles with Henry Hyde and Ken Starr had turned out to be oddly therapeutic for him. And the fact that, you know, my family stayed together and Hillary stayed with me and my daughter got through this, it was all pretty wonderful in a certain way. I mean, the overall thing was terrible, but the American people got it. I'd give anything if I hadn't done it, and anything if it hadn't happened. But there were some unbelievably touching moments, as well as the larger fact that my family came through it and the public stayed with me. And I think that was a heartfelt moment in our conversations. Uh, in terms of Congress's tactical mistakes, one of the great miscalculations of Henry Hyde and the House managers, I think, was that they believed they could preordain what Bill Clinton's place in history would be by ramming through an impeachment vote in the House uh, before they left. They felt that, that would put an asterisk next to President Clinton's name, so he would be only the second president in our, in our history ever to be impeached by the House. And when I told that to President Clinton, he said, yeah, and I hope there are two asterisks next to my name. And the second is that I beat them, and I beat them like a yard dog. He hadn't lost his feistiness since now. <laughs> but the, the, the thing is that you cannot force history into a certain path. And incidentally, I have great respect for Henry Hyde. He was a wonderful, wonderful public servant. And in fact, I'm not going to single him out, but Sam Stratton, one of his closest advisors, is here today. And they were extraordinarily helpful to me. But you cannot take the bucking bronco of history and tell it's, it, where it's going to go and dictate in advance what a president's legacy will be. In this case, this president's legacy is still being written by his deeds in Haiti and around the world, by the accomplishments of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, the first first lady in American history ever to become a world-renowned public figure in her own right after her husband left office, and through the prism of hindsight that allows us to see that the economic growth and, and the domestic accomplishments of the Clinton administration were quite remarkable when we look at them a decade later. So I believe the House managers grossly overestimated their ability to write the end of this story. And ironically, in the end, many of them look reckless and embittered while Clinton survives wounded but still walking. Um, and let me just say, the one person who I think behaved very admirably here, since this is Supreme Court week, is Chief Justice William Rehnquist. He just did a fabulous job presiding over that trial, as did, and I interviewed Justice Sandra Day O'Connor. I think my hat's off to the whole court. Um, for how it removed itself from this political swamp, stayed far away from it. That was the right thing for the Supreme Court to do. 
So let me start wrapping up by talking about the relevance of this today. I believe the Clinton Star train wreck was a watershed event in the United States in a profoundly negative way. Any of you who lived through it know that it divided our country really unlike any other modern political upheaval. We certainly had other events. We had Watergate, we had the board confirmation hearings, we had Iran-Contra, but those were fought out more at an elite level. This was the first one that separated and polarized the country right down the middle to the point that you could go into any grocery store, as you know, in the United States, and people would be arguing with their veins bulging out saying who was the evil person, who was the bad person here. So this story is not about black and white. It's not about good and evil. It's about sharing the blame. And incidentally, I was showing Jeff before I came over, even though it's hard to see, the front of the book is President Clinton. But if you look from a distance, the back is Ken Starr. And that was done intentionally. Um, I really believe that it wasn't just Ken Starr the person, Bill Clinton the person, but the angry cohorts that grew up around them in every court, corner of this country we lost our compass, folks, and this is what paved the way for red states and blue states, for liberal and conservative television shows and radio shows, and the dysfunction that we are witnessing in Washington today, as evidenced most recently, perhaps, by the angry disagreements over health care. And here's the scary part. Let me slow down the picture for you for a second and look at the film of the Clinton Star battle in slow motion. I was able to show that as the FBI was running around interviewing women in Arkansas about past sexual liaisons with Bill Clinton 10 years earlier, there was a never disclosed, before disclosed assassination attempt of President Clinton in the Philippines. I interviewed Lou Merletti, the head of the Secret Service. There was a bomb under a bridge big enough to blow up the entire presidential motorcade. And fortunately, they diverted the motorcade, and that was avoided. But it was later determined to have been planted there by a then little-known terrorist named Osama bin Laden. So this is what was going on, folks, as we were distracted as a country and running around focusing on Monica Lewinsky and impeachment this is what was happening as people inside and outside our country were plotting our attack. I told you that I began and ended this book at Chautauqua, so I wanted to say a word before ending about the, the, the end of the book. I was getting ready to write the final chapter, and Greg and Cindy Peterson, and Greg's back here, who have been great friends since my first visit to Chautauqua, offered to let me hide away in their place across from the Athenaeum to try to wrap up so my editor didn't throttle me. Life got a little busy, so instead of getting here as I had dreamed, like Bill and Hillary Clinton as the fall leaves were blowing across the lawn of the Athenaeum, I got here in early December and there were five feet of snow. <laughs> so I was literally the only person on the grounds of the, Athe of the Chautauqua Institution. I had just flown back from Arkansas where I met with Susan McDougall, and even though this was very painful for her, she took me to visit the grave of her ex-husband, Jim, because in this little town of Arkadelphia, because I wanted to end the book there. I purposely wanted to end the story this way because there were bodies littered across the road everywhere you turned in the story. Um, Jim McDougall dies on a prison floor in solitary confinement in Fort Worth, Texas, in a prison. Uh, Vince Foster, a great man, a lawyer's lawyer, who goes to Washington to make a contribution, to make something with the Clintons, and comes back to Little Rock in a casket. So I wanted the reader to feel that jarring sense of tragedy, but I also wanted to close the book with a sense of hope, that there was a way out of this mess, and that this mess that the protagonists, but that all of us had created. Um, so I sat in the Peterson's apartment across from the Athenaeum and typed away on my laptop until I finally typed the words, the end, here at Chautauqua alone, as snow was blowing off the lake there. So I won't ruin the ending for you, but I can tell you that at the end, the only hero in this book, after 690 pages, is the American public. Because they understood the facts. They figured out long before 
it was officially announced that President Clinton had lied here about having an affair with Monica Lewinsky. They knew he hadn't told the truth in the Paul Jones deposition, and that was not a good thing. But they also knew that the punishment didn't fit the crime. And that's why when it came to the impeachment trial, it was really the American public who said, enough, we get it, move on, get back to the business of governing the country. And so my greatest hope is that by studying this very difficult episode in American history that played out in Arkansas and Washington and New York and Pennsylvania and across the whole United States, that we will come to recognize that making politics a blood sport is not healthy for any nation that professes to govern itself by a system of laws. Sometimes if we fight to the bitter end in the name of our own version of American virtue, we end up damaging or destroying the very institutions of government we were sworn to protect. It is never too late to learn that lesson so that the upcoming generation of lawyers and public citizen, uh, and, and citizens, public servants, everyone understands the innately, really, as a matter of first principle, that restraint is a powerful, indeed an indispensable piece of what we call American virtue, which is why it is such a special pleasure and honor to join you in the Hall of Philosophy today, where this book literally took shape and came to life. Thank you so very much for that. Well, I, I was telling people at lunch, I've had reporters from the Irish Times and Vanity Fair and all over the country trying to have me put them in touch with Monica Lewinsky and asking where she is and what she's doing. And the family has been very private about all of this, and I've respected that. Um, I, I can tell you that she generally spends time mainly in New York and L.A., where her two parents are. Uh, she did get a, a, a master's at the London School of Economics. As I said, she's an extremely intelligent woman. And she is just basically trying to move on with her life at this point. Yeah, um, you, you mentioned that the Supreme Court had stayed clear of the, of the whole mess, and I just wanted to refresh my recollection. Didn't they, didn't they have an opportunity to allow the Paula Jones sexual harassment suit to be deferred, and instead they allowed it to go forward, and that turned out, I believe, to uh, have been to the chagrin of several members of the board as they expressed it later. Yes, that's a, that's a good point. In the Paula Jones case, uh, clearly Judge Susan Weber Wright, the lower court judge, had suggested waiting until the president got out of office. I teach constitutional law. I've said in the past, and in fact I said in 1999, that it was a politically naive decision. And Justice O'Connor came up to me later and said, yes, I was naively sitting there listening to your lecture. So it <laughs> got me there. But, but I think it was correct as a matter of constitutional law there is no uh, immunity for a president from, from suit. And um, Congress would have to change that. But I do have to make this point. I interviewed Justice Stevens, who wrote the Paula Jones decision, hardly what you would call a rabid conservative. And Justice Stevens told me he would not have changed a single word of that. And here's the really interesting point he made. Even if they had deferred this case, there was no way they would not have required the deposition of Bill Clinton. In fact, even more so they would have required it to preserve the evidence. It would just be the trial. So one way or the other, the train that was coming at Bill Clinton was that Paula Jones deposition. And frankly, he was going to lie about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky there. That was the problem. But thank you for that question. Yes? At the end of your book, the hero was the American people. But the Clinton issue was one that they could understand in the own family. Our country faces very complex problems like education, and economy, and things like that. And we're politically divided. I'm, I don't see the public or the citizens have the tools to really discuss issues. And I'm worried about the future of our constitutional democracy. Um, it's really interesting. I have to tell you, I've done over a hundred radio interviews all over the country, liberal, conservative, all over the map. One of the things that has been most heartening to me is I detect 
that the American public understands more so right now than our leaders in Washington that this has not been a good path that we have been on. The Clinton Star story is kind of allows you to, to frame it, but it continues to this day, as you know, with this angry popularization is what this did of this polarization. I have to tell you that that's the encouraging thing to me. My sense is the public does understand it, and usually that has an impact in terms of who's elected into office. It takes a little while for it to have some impact, but I have optimism that in fact we're going to begin seeing a significant change of this approach in Washington. I don't think the public's going to put up with it, frankly. Uh, I read your book and it was a great read. I enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I, was I paid him to say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I was impressed with the fact that you, you made no conclusion, actually. There's no introduction and no conclusion. Uh, the meaning of these events uh, is left untouched, except in the title. And I wonder about the title. It seems that these events were transformative, that we were virtuous yesterday, and after Clinton and Ken Stone. It's a creative process, and that title just popped into my head years ago. Actually, it was originally going to be flipped around and be Clinton versus Starr, The Death of American Virtue. But again, I was talking about this sense of public virtue where you knew that you had to hold yourself back and just because you could bloody the other side, you didn't necessarily do it. And incidentally, um, you have, I read that passage, and I appreciate your asking the question, but I read that passage on purpose because I never said American virtue was dead. I just said that these events were hastening the death of American virtue, this notion that we, I believe, was very strong in our republic before, that you, you had to, as a public servant, take great care in protecting the Constitution and the government, even if that meant that you didn't necessarily win every battle. And so it's a cautionary tale in many ways, and certainly uh, I do not believe that we have reached the end of American virtue in any respect, but I think these events must make us look in the mirror, as I said, and be very concerned if we continue to go down this path. I believe you said near the end of the book that uh, they were close to indicting Hillary Clinton yes. for perjury over, I can't remember, it was the FBI files of Travelgate or both? Whitewater. Over Whitewater. Your opinion, uh, did she commit perjury? No, th actually it was uh, Madison Guarantee. I, I was one of the only people, this was in the Chautauqua Daily today, to see that draft indictment of Hillary Clinton. And I have to tell you, it was one of the most heart pounding moments of this whole project. When I found it, it was somewhere it shouldn't be. I got my hands on it. That's what writers do. Uh, President and Mrs. Clinton have never seen that. What was it, was, it all related to Madison Guarantee and, and Whitewater and all that early stuff. I do not believe, let's, let me make it clear, that the Star Report, the final, uh, the final Office of Independent Counsel report, does not find sufficient evidence to proceed with respect to those claims. Uh, I did not see evidence of wrongdoing. One of Ken Starr's prosecutors, Hickman Ewing Jr., told me uh, only half facetiously that he was the one who was focused on that and wanted to bring it, uh, get her indicted. And it was because his colleagues in the Independent Counsel Office were all fixated on Monica Lewinsky and thought that this was a slam dunk, that they dropped Whitewater, and he said half facetiously, Monica saved Hillary. Um, I don't think that that's the case, I, but what's most interesting, why I have it in there, is it showed how hard Starr's prosecutors were pushing at this point, because it was right at the moment where Monica was not cooperating. Remember, we had months of time where she was not admitting there was an affair, and they knew Clinton was lying and they couldn't prove it, and so they were pushing on, on, on all angles, indicting Webb Hubble again, looking into indicting Mrs. Clinton, uh, but in the end, I do not believe that that shows any wrongdoing on her part. Thank you. Did President Clinton talk to you at all about what he thought he could have accomplished in the time when he, this was taken, or what he 
could have accomplished had he not had the, the harm to his political capital? And, or, or do you have any thoughts on what was lost? Yeah, that's a great question. The party line, of course, is that he could compartmentalize so much it didn't impact them all. That's impossible. And when I talked to his closest advisors, you know, confidentially, there was no way this didn't impact him. He would wake up with his eyes puffy in the morning, and, and this was weighing on him heavily. But I must say, they did a remarkable job of getting Bill Clinton to live in a parallel universe. His advisors were keenly aware that Richard Nixon had become so obsessed with Watergate, it ate him alive, and that led to his demise. And they were bound and determined not to let Clinton do that. So they, to a person, told me, if you were to walk into the White House, you would not know all this was going on out there at all. It was business as usual. And one of the most incredible things to me was his State of the Union address in 1999. Here he goes into Congress with the very people who were by day trying to impeach him, stands up there, I would have fallen over, he stands up and gives the most brilliant State of the Union address of his career. Uh, when, it when it comes to lost opportunities though, some of his aides clearly talked about the sense of anger and loss for them because they saw all this promise. I have a scene when he's giving a speech in Ireland, for instance, about the peace accords there. And his aides are thinking, what more we could have done in these last few years if it hadn't been for that. There's no question that it left, uh, it left a mark, it detracted. And that's the part, I think, that's so hard for President Clinton still today. Because in his view, this was all a setup from the start. And it was unfair that all of this happened. Well, what about congressional leaders? Did they talk to you at all about what they thought was lost? Well, that's a good question. I think the congressional leaders were so caught up in this themselves, they weren't going to touch that issue because they were partly responsible for it. Um, so I, I did not hear a lot of discussion about that. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Okay, three questions, two minutes. I've seen reports that uh, the real stage manager of the impeachment was Newt Gingrich. What's your take on that? Well, Newt Gingrich was the stage manager at the very early stages, and then he exited stage right. If you remember, he uh, he put all of his money in trying to make the Clinton the Clinton uh, transgressions the centerpiece of the elections, and and they lost the midterm elections dramatically. So Newt Gingrich was not steering this. Henry Hyde uh, was largely. And, and I believe, incidentally, Henry Hyde truly believed that he had a duty to do this, even if it hurt him politically. I really do believe that. But it, it was largely the leadership that was left after Newt Gingrich that drove the, the ship after that. Yes, ma'am? You've given us some good commentary, additional insights into these major figures, but you didn't mention Susan McDougall. Could you give us a little more insight on her and in the end where she Ended up. Yeah, Susan McDougall I could talk about for an hour. She was a really interesting person, a very colorful character. I've spent a lot of time with her. As you know, I disclose in the book for the first time that uh, President Clinton did have an affair with Susan McDougall while he was governor of Arkansas. Not that that is noteworthy on many levels, but it was important because Ken Starr's office spent about $40 million trying to figure that out, so I thought I would tell them the answer. <laughs> um, but the, the, and I don't reveal my sources, but I do say conclusively that that was the case. But Susan McDougall was an interesting character. I can tell you that was having this uh, brief fling with President Clinton when her marriage had deteriorated had nothing to do with her going to prison and not testifying for Ken Starr's prosecutors. It had everything to do with the fact she saw Ken Starr's prosecutors turn Jim, her ex-husband, into, as she told me, a craven liar who would say and do anything to avoid trying to go to prison. And she believed no matter what she told them, if she did not give incriminating evidence against the Clintons, which she did not have, they would put her in prison anyway, so she might as well go there. I can tell you, when you talk about little silver linings, Susan McDougall, just such an interesting character, has spent, I, you know, I can't really comment on Monica Lewinsky, but I can tell you Susan McDougall is getting a master's in divinity, I believe, in counseling, and has spent much of her time counseling women in prison since all of this, and has had a very, very productive life. 
I would like to think that time eventually heals all wounds. Has there been any reconciliation between Ken Starr and Bill Clinton? And if not yet, can you ever envision this happening? That is the million dollar question. Um, I can tell you it is not likely to happen in any time soon because the wounds are still too raw. Uh, and I would say, especially for President Clinton, this, this was a horrible piece of his life in public service. Um, I've, I've talked to Ken Starr about it. He's now president of Baylor. Still a wonderful person, I can tell you. I think he'll do a great job as president of Baylor. And I think that he has some remorse, as I said in the paper this morning, that all of this happened and that he ended up in the middle of it. Um, but I, I think President Clinton is very angry because uh, he believes that all of this was set into motion because people set out to destroy his presidency from the day he walked into the White House. And let me say, I think that's largely true, but that's true of almost any president. This was just fate again brought so many pieces together. You have a former business partner who turns into a con artist, turns on you, and also happens to be um, bipolar and, and almost crazy, Jim McDougal. That is complicating for him. Vince Foster committing suicide, the Paula Jones thing. It is a really tragic story. And ultimately, I think that if there is a healing process, it has to come from the people pushing their officials to recognize that we just cannot afford to go down this path again, ever again. The bottom line, it was, it was hurtful to everyone. And that is not a good ending to have to any story. Thank you so very much. Join us over for a reception. Books I need to want over. Well, my heart.